So you are suspecting that you might have a labrum tear in your shoulder, or maybe you've re been recently diagnosed with a labrum tear. Trust me, you are definitely not alone, and they honestly kind of happen more than you think. And you you might have had it previously and might not have even known about it before it became symptomatic. I personally have had a slap repair and a posterior labrum repair together at the same time back in 2020. So I can definitely speak to the treating side of things, the patient side of things, the pre-op side of things, and the post-op side of things. So trust me, you're definitely not alone with that. First, you have to consider that with labrum tears, you can have major league baseball players that have labrum tears that don't need surgery for it. So just because you have a labrum tear does not mean you're doomed to have surgery. So keep that in mind. A lot of times, all you have to do is improve the mobility, improve the strength, and you're good to go pain-free, right? Those surgeries do exist for a reason, but not everyone needs it. So a lot of times, if you have a labrum tear, then you get referred to physical therapy, you complete your plan of care, you either improve or you technically fail conservative care. That can be completing your plan of care with your physical therapist. Either you plateau in your progress or you don't really progress or you're still having symptoms. And that would then make you more likely to potentially need surgery. Doctors will then also oftentimes have injections or other things like that before going straight to surgery because honestly, that post-op process is not fun. And if you can avoid it, I definitely recommend it. The rehab time, the standard rehab time after a shoulder surgery is six months to a year. And a lot of people don't know that going in. They think, oh, I have surgery. I don't really have to do a lot of work. It's all done for me. But you have to put in a lot of work. Honestly, beforehand would be ideal and also after. The after, you have to put a lot of work in, time in. It's not comfortable and it takes a long time. So for me, for example, it took a year and three months before I was like, I feel great. And then I also lost a ton of other like muscle elsewhere. And so it probably took a couple of years, honestly, after that to really feel like even like my legs felt strong again because I couldn't lift weights. So for starters, I think step one is obviously getting assessed by a medical professional. Dr. Google is not the best with all this. I'll tell you it's a lot of different pathologies and things that can be happening with the shoulder. So especially if you're not diagnosed yet with, you know, an MRI, you know, a lot of times the doc step one is going to be an x-ray, maybe an injection referral to PT. The insurance also plays a role in terms of what you're able to do and in what they, you know, are willing to pay for. You might have to do PT before you get an MRI or vice versa. So don't be frustrated with your physician or, you know, your PT if that's the case. Again, there's a lot of different variables. That's just what it looks like from how it, you know, the, the steps to even getting an MRI. But like I said, just trying to self-diagnose with this, a lot of people, I hate to say, are frequently wrong. Even in my experience as well, if people do have or need surgery, I'd say they kind of recover a little bit faster in the short term at least and long term as well because they're familiar with the exercises that you might be trying out, um, just the general muscle mass in the body part and, you know, areas around it. So just food for thought that you're not just wasting your time if you do need a surgery as well. But in the end, I think, like I said, you want to go that route, but we'll still kind of dive into a few things that you might be able to try if your symptoms allow to try to improve your outcomes. The first one that we'll, we'll show real quick is just simple range of motion exercises. Here we have a humongous dowel, um, <laughs> but you can honestly, in the clinic, we'll just have people use a broomstick a lot of the times. So just using your other arm to help bring your arm overhead, especially for a lot of people, once they get past about 90 degrees, it starts to become a little bit painful. So the interesting thing about this is that once you bring it back past here, gravity is actually helping bring it over. So that might make it a little bit easier of an option to get your arm overhead without it hurting as badly as it does when you just try to raise your arm up and that'll help keep the muscles flexible in the shoulder. Another one to do is to work the rotational component as well. So you'll see she's coming here and you can just try to keep your elbow closer to your side as you go outwards using your opposite arm to guide it. So you're not going and pushing your arm out like this and you see how her elbow leaves her side. It's just keeping it there. Neither of these are ones that we're trying to really promote the, you know, stretch to a point where you feel like it's either gonna sublux or pop out of place. And the other thing with this is it is not abnormal depending on your setup to get some clicking. 
as you try it out, there's different variations of your hand position, your elbow position as well when you're trying this that can help that. So for example, the one she's doing right now, you might need to put a pillow or towels underneath the elbow and that might keep it from going back this ways, which might make it click. And then the other thing with the arms overhead, maybe some people try to do it with their elbows bent and that might make it click. And you might also need to grip a little bit wider on the bar as well. So just be mindful of those kind of alternatives to see if that may, plays a role in terms of decreasing the clicking sensation. So once we gain the range of motion with those exercises, you want to strengthen as well throughout those ranges. So Steve is going to do a sideline external rotation. So you're keeping your elbow in by your side here and lifting the forearm up, going as far as you feel comfortable. You're gonna feel the back of the shoulder blade kind of in this area working. Make sure you don't let the elbow come away from your side. So if you do need like a towel or something like that in between your side and your elbow, you can have that as well, kind of like Steve did with the weight. But just to kind of cue you to keep it there, I wouldn't necessarily use a weight at home, but um, just for demonstration purposes there. And you can progress using a weight. So Steve right now is using a three pound weight, honestly, even with like me doing this, I'm not gonna do, even though I no longer have shoulder issues, I wouldn't use it more than like a five pound weight probably for this. Even um, with uh, like baseball pitchers without any injury, it's very rare to go over five pounds with this exercise because you just start to compensate with different muscles instead. With this, you can also use a can of beans, can of spaghetti sauce, something like that, maybe a water bottle if you're doing a lighter weight too and you don't necessarily have plates or weights at home that go that light. Another thing too, working the range of motion and also the scapular mechanics or that shoulder blade, you can do a side lying abduction. So starting with your arm by your side and going overhead, you can come there and stopping at about 90 degrees, or you can have the palm facing forward and go overhead all the way too, to get a little bit more of that range of motion. And you can use that weight to get a little bit of a stretch and then controlling it back down. So depending on your range of motion that you have access to and how it feels, you can change it accordingly. But make sure if you're going overhead, have your palm facing forward because if it's down, it kind of just rotates the shoulder a little bit funky and can not be the most comfortable for you. The other thing too is a lot of people might try this out and you might feel a clicking sensation. A common tip to do that is to just roll your chest and open it up towards the sky just a little bit more and then it shouldn't click anymore in case it's bothering you when it does that. So another common one we'll do, this is definitely somewhere between the intermediate, I wouldn't quite say advanced, but probably not beginner level, depending on how your shoulders can tolerate it, would be you know prone I, Ys, and Ts. You don't have to be on a ball specifically. I mean, you could use a bench, end of a table, but just pretty much recreating the letter I by going straight over, a Y where you're going out more in this direction, and a T out more straight to the side. Really trying to make sure that the work is coming from your shoulder blades and that's what's driving the range of motion as opposed to just trying to flail your hands up. So really, really, really trying to focus on that. The other reason that's really important to probably not just do this right off the bat for most people is it's especially impactful for your lower trapezius muscle to really get that last little bit of range of motion. And that's a really important muscle to retrain in the shoulder blade and it just, it just doesn't a lot of our patients don't really feel that muscle working so much for the first like 80, 90% of the range of motion. It's really that last 10, 20%. But if it is symptomatic for you to get that far, then maybe not exactly the you know best thing to focus on. And maybe you need to just work on some of the simpler ones first to build your activity tolerance up to there. Another thing too, you'll see it done two different ways. Sometimes people will call the eyes overhead. Some people will call the eyes back in here. Mm -hmm. So if overhead is a little bit too much, mm -hmm. you can also just go here mm -hmm. and back down, really focusing on the shoulder blade mm -hmm. pinching together. And then once that's a little bit easier, then you can try the T's. Once that's a little bit easier, mm -hmm. then you can try adding in the Y's. So you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to do all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can just take what's comfortable for you at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that being said, we have, you know, it's kind of hard on a, a smaller ball like this, but people on like a bench where they ha can, you know, kind of reach down and not hit the ground. You, in theory, could do the eye through that whole range of motion going back to here, 
but just be very careful because once you start doing that, you're going to find that it's very easy to swing your arm and use momentum instead of controlling with your muscles. And then you're really not doing much of any good for yourself. And then if you do want more of these types of exercises, I do have a full shoulder prehab program that has some mobility stuff and some similar strengthening exercises too. So now that we talked about what to do, let's chat a little bit about what not to do. And a lot of people think, oh, shoulder is bothering me. I need to rest, ice, compression, elevation, all of that stuff, minus the elevation because of the shoulder, right? So you're, the first thing that people think about is rest. And specifically with the shoulder, if you're resting for a prolonged period of time, you can actually get some like frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis or things like that and it can create other issues. So you always, with really any injury, you wanna use what you have at that time that's more pain-free, right? So using your shoulder however way you can and not necessarily being afraid, even if it's like a small motion, just using that motion that you have right now can be really helpful in preventing any complications with the injury. And pushing through the pain with these exercises on the, on the flip side, right? So that's, hey, go move it. But then on the flip side, don't just push through it. So it's a really fine balance that we work with our patients in the physical therapy realm with that. And, you know, working them in a pain-free range is, is, you know, the simplest, easiest way of just saying it on a video. But, you know, really that's where having someone that can see what's going on, even, you know, as we talked about the on the ball, like the pro and high Ys and Ts. And, you know, even as we talked about the using of the dowel, hey, I might have clicking with this and it hurts. Oh, it might be just as simple as moving your arms out a little bit further or not. Maybe it's just the exercise itself. Maybe it's what, what you're doing, how you're doing it. Maybe it's the position your arm is starting it. So there's a lot of different variables where having a, a different pair of eyes will help guide you with what's appropriate or not. And like I said, just helping a little bit more from a diagnostic standpoint, because depending on what actually is the cause of your symptoms, is gonna dictate whether we want to be pushing through with certain exercises or not. But general rule of thumb with someone with you know this specific presentation, pushing through is not gonna really help you. It's more about performing things through a pain-free range of motion and just building your activity tolerance up and the strength of your stabilizing muscles in the pain-free manner. So pushing through will actually set you back a little bit more, potentially make the shoulder inherently a little bit less stable as well and probably create some compensatory strategies that are just increasing your pain and potentially causing some of the pathology that she described before. So keep in mind that one person's presentation can be completely different than yours. So for example, before I had shoulder surgery, I knew how long it was gonna be before I could do really anything again. So I was like, let's go for it, let's go rock climbing the week before my shoulder surgery. So obviously my presentation was a little bit different. It was really symptomatic with the hanging um, on a bar for so like pull-ups more than six to eight reps or really anything pushing across. So like if I had to manipulate someone's neck at work, that horizontal motion here coming across typically bothered me. So that was why I opted to have that surgery after trying to do my own conservative care for probably way too long because I was stubborn. Then again, I've had patients where their symptoms start and they're only able to come with their arm up this high. So one person can be going rock climbing or doing, that's probably a little bit more rare than, but also like this is also a little bit more on the extreme variation of can't do a whole lot as well. So you probably are somewhere in the middle of those things and that's perfectly okay. And so that's why someone who can go rock climbing and someone who can barely lift their arm are gonna have completely different exercises that are appropriate for them at that time. And then again, if you're most limited in your overhead motion, go ahead, we're gonna link a video probably over here for you where we broke down overhead motion, what's involved, what might be contributing, and that might help you gain a little bit more overhead motion. Or if you want some strengthening, I will link a band only shoulder workout. Again, it's probably a little bit higher level. Or if you want a little bit more prehab specifically, I do have that shoulder prehab program for you too.